So, well, since today's the first day, as usual, uh, I just figured we could start first by going a little bit over the syllabus, and uh, then I'll give you a little bit, uh, tell you a little bit of probability theory, give you some examples, um, say a couple of things about it, um, and depending on how much time we have left, then we can see um, what else um, to, to discuss. Uh, okay, let me share first. Um, the main screen. I don't know if you had ch a chance to. Uh, yeah, I'll upload it. I'll upload the recording. So, yeah, I don't know if you had a chance to um, read the announcements, but in general, uh, I'll probably send like one or two announcements after each class. So just uh, keep an eye on them, on them and just try to read them regularly. Um, the only thing that I said there, um, besides the fact that the syllabus is, is on the Canvas side, uh, I usually create like an assignment. Well, assignment in quotes is kind of fake where you can introduce yourself if you want. Um, it just gives me a good, a better idea of like, you know, what people are interested in and things like that. So if you haven't had a chance, I think like only like two or three of you have written an introduction it's optional so you don't have to but at the same time uh you don't have to give your real name so it can be anonymous um so but yeah it's just useful more for me to get like a sense of what you're interested in um you can mention like you know what what you like what courses you have taken things of that sort uh, then i i get a better sense of which exam which examples to use like the thing about probability theory especially for probability is that it gets used um, in many different contexts. And so sometimes like the, uh, from a, like, you know, from a mathematical point of view, like the, the solution can be the same for a problem in biology that involves probability or a problem in physics that involves probability. But if you prefer to think, you know, in terms of genes, like it just make it maybe it's easier to think about the problem than if you think about it, like in terms of, Co uh, throwing coins or dice, rolling dice. So it, you know, many times, like one of the funny things about probability is like, if you have like kind of the right picture in mind, e the problem becomes a lot easier. And if you have like a, like a somewhat complicated analogy, it is hard to figure out the answer. So yeah, based on what you are interested in, it's kind of easier to come up with examples which could be um you know closer to how you usually think about these things um but yeah so you can feel it and you can complete it there if you want uh then um oh i noticed that it, it never is um yeah so that you can find the syllabus here uh this well, so that's the book that we're going to use. I can show it to you. Uh, I have a physical copy here. Um, it's like the probability book by Ross. It is, um, you know, there are many editions about of this book. So you probably, like the one that I have on the syllabus is the 10th edition, which is the official one for this course. But I mean, you probably know that between different editions, there are like usually just minor changes. So if you can find on, on online or even on eBay or Amazon, whatever, like a used version of another edition, that's more than enough. Like, I'm not going to ask you to get a physical, I'm not going to ask you to purchase a book. It is convenient to have like some sort of book for this course, but I'll probably just like upload, uh, since everyone has, I am assuming most of you are like officially Rutgers students are not, not taking the course from, from a different university, but you, through the Rutgers library, you can, there are a bunch of books that you can download for free as a PDF, uh, legally, I mean. And so I'll recommend um, probably like at least one more that you can check if you don't want to purchase the Ross book um, to, you know, kind of have to have something to read uh, besides what we cover in class. But, you know, probably it's kind of like one of these those things where there are not that many formulas. It is more like about the examples that you do. So 
it's not that there's too much to read in that sense. It's more like getting acquainted, getting used to certain types of problems. Uh, the formulas are re actually relatively straightforward. Um, so, and, and especially for the first part of, of the course, um, which is discrete probability. I'll tell you more about it in a couple of minutes. But so it's not too much about the theory, but it's more like examples. Uh, so, but yeah, so like, I'm, you don't have to purchase a book um, if you don't want to. But in, if in case, I'm sure like if you go online, if you do some some Google searches, you can find, um, you should be able to find like older editions and things like that in a, a more easily. So yeah, but in any case, like this is kind of like a rough summer and summary of the uh, chapters that we have to cover. And um, and a schedule for the uh, for the course. So basically, um, like in terms of like the grading and things like that, um, like this course doesn't have like online assignments like my lab, which you may have done like if you took like calculus courses at Rutgers. So like what we'll do is like we'll rely more like on, on the quizzes and the uh, exams. So basically, what I'll do for, I mean, what I prefer to do for the quizzes and things like that. Yeah, let me go back. Um, I already posted like a preliminary list of problems. Uh, probably add a couple of problems here. Um, but yeah, usually what I'll do for the quizzes and, and things like that is like from this list of problems, I tell you uh, study problems three, four, five, or six. Well, like I'll give you a couple of problems to study for each quiz and I'll then just like the questions on the quiz would just be a subset of, of like will be some of those questions that I told you to to look at. So that way, you know, everyone has kind of like an incentive to go over the problems that I recommend for the quiz because they will literally, some of them will appear on the quiz. And then, and yeah, so kind of like I'm trying to build like a representative, a good enough list of problems um, for you to have. And that way also, if you don't want to ha have get the book, then you have like a sufficiently decent list to, of problems to look at. I'll give you also like a version that has like the numerical answers for, for those problems. So you'll have like an answer key for the problems. I'll probably post it somewhere, uh, some, um, some point later in the week. And then, uh, and yeah, since our courses online, um, the quizzes and the exams, um, you know, will be taken online. So we will use like respondents, um, to, to take them. I don't know if you have uh, used responders in the past, but I'll kind of uh, create like an assignment for you to do on responders, like no grade or anything, just for you to get acquainted to how it works. Um, and uh, that's basically what we'll do for, for the exams and the, and the quizzes. Is that making sense? Any questions about this? Are so good. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah, so feel free, by the way, in general, like you can totally interrupt me uh, if you want to talk or if you prefer just to write it on the chat, that's up to you. Uh, yeah, the quiz will just be, typically I'll probably give you like four or five problems for each quiz. I mean, it depends. Like sometimes maybe more other times. Um, but yeah, it won't be like an absurd number of problems. That's what I'm trying to say. And then the quizzes, I will just take them from, from there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there will be uh, zero uncertainty of what will be on the quiz in that sense. Um, so we'll do them, by the way, at the end of each class. I mean, the days that we have the quizzes, like I'll aim for like, two quizzes per week, except like, you know, the day, the weeks that we have the exams or like this week, because it's the first week, so we will just have um, one. But yeah, the, usually the quizzes will take place during the like, you know, last 30 or 40 minutes of class, because I also have to give you like an, a time for you to upload your solutions to Canvas. And so, yeah, it will happen. Um, no, so the homework, what I'm calling homework, um, yeah, so, I mean, the, it depends on what you're calling. Uh, Canvas assignments, 
Oh, so the Canvas assignments can, like, I'm keeping it very open at the moment. Canvas assignments could be just like, oh, I find this video on YouTube, which is interesting. So I want you to watch it and I'll ask you to answer one or two questions about the video. Or I want you to upload the solution to a problem. Or I want you to do something like of that sort. So those will be graded. Once I create like a Canvas assignment, that will be graded. Uh, just like what and the assignment can vary from week to week, depending on, you know, what we're doing, um, what um, the this list of problems. Um, yeah, I guess there potentially there could be a, a, a Canvas assignment that's like answer one of these problems, but more or less like the way I will use this PDF will be more like, oh, from this list, this, these problems potentially can be on this given quiz. So I'll more or less test this list of problems through the quizzes. So more, Typically for the Canvas assignments, um, it will be more like something more complementary to the course. So it won't be as frequent, um, you know, as a, you know, as a quizzes or anything like that. Like, for example, if you read the first announcement I had sent, um, I had, like, I sent you like a video about the Monty Hall problem. That's like a very famous problem, um, a very confusing uh, problem, in fact. And so like a Canvas assignment could be, oh, watch this video and answer like a question or two about it. You know what I mean? But yeah, it would depend like on the specifics of what we're doing in um, during class and things like that. But yeah, they will be graded. Um, yeah, in fact, like if you haven't watched this preview, it's kind of fun to watch. Uh, what makes it fun of, about the multiple problem is that it was very controversial. So, you know, very famous mathematicians and things like that uh, would like, you know, there was like a big public uh, like argument about like the solution to this problem. And like many famous people like got, you know, had like the wrong idea, like people who had specialized in probability and things like that. So it's kind of like, uh, kind of like a reminder that probability, like we don't have like, uh, you know, as human beings that like we don't necessarily have good intuitions about probability in the same way in which maybe we have intuitions about other areas of mathematics, like in geom like geometry or things like that. People are usually better to have like a good sense of, geometrical properties than like probability statements. So probability can be very counterintuitive um, and like kind of like the fun thing about a probability course is kind of to go through like the paradoxes or the weird things that happen, can happen when you think about in terms of probability theory. Uh, Uh, yeah, like in general, what we can do, like, um, so I didn't have office hours today because it was the first day, but in general, we would, um, I, my office hours are scheduled, will be scheduled for like the first few minutes before the class starts. So what I'll do, um, you know, I only created like the Zoom link for today, but I'll, once I create the next few, Zoom, the next Zoom link for the next meeting, like they'll start at 530. Not because like the class will start five thirty, just because the office hours will be like thirty minutes before class. So if someone wants to show up before six to ask me questions, then you can do that. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So I mean, I wouldn't even call that a homework. I mean, I'll the quiz questions will be based on this PDF. So they would on, only be graded through the quizzes, like those that appear on the quizzes. And then, yeah, there will be a different thing called Canvas assignments, but they will appear literally like as an assignment. So they will they will have like a number, uh, some points uh, next to them. Yeah, so those, um, those, yeah, will be separate and will be graded. And I don't know on the syllabus if I put 5% or more, but um, yeah, so what's the percentage I have for these assignments? Um, I haven't, I have them at 6%, yeah. So those are the ones that will be graded. Is that making sense? Yeah, so I mean, uh, but again, like the usual, like the point of this assignment is more like uh, to enhance your knowledge, however you want to think about it. So it I'll try to find something fun or interesting, you know, that is obviously, intersects with the course, but it can be a small deviation from the things that we do. Hence, if you, that's why I was saying, um, 
if you also answer your, like, if you write something about yourself on this hello world assignment, which by the way, this one is not an assignment in the sense, this one is not greater, but if you ask, uh, um, add something about yourself there, like I can get like a better sense of what people are interested in. And then I can find, you know, kind of can cater, you know, the class to your interest. Yeah, so after each class, I'll more or less tell you this corresponds to these sections in the book, more or less. Uh, sometimes I change the order, like we'll, you know, make not cover the book linearly, like section one point. I mean, sometimes, uh, but yeah, I'll try to tell you at the end of each class, more or less what I did to what sections of the book that corresponds to. I also like, you know, um, send you once the class is over, I'll share like whatever I wrote on my iPad with the class. So I'll, I'll provide the notes of the class. I also record the classes. Is that making sense? Any, any other questions? Uh, yeah, by the way, I think I'm getting some emails that some of you, did you require like a password to enter the Zoom meeting? Um, I'm just getting some emails from other students who, I don't think I, I put like any password whatsoever. Um, were you able to like, uh, let's see. Okay, so you just logged in. Okay, yeah, so I don't know what's going on. Um, okay, well, anyways, it's re being recorded, so it's not such a problem, but I'll try to see what could have been the situation um, with the... Oh. So if you, okay, 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 I, I get it. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll send an, let me just enter a quick, send a, an announcement about it. Um, and just to reply to them in case they still want to join in. Um, yeah, this is the first time uh, that this is happening. Okay. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, so now that we have um, gone over like some of the basics of the course, um, I figured um, I could just give you first like an introduction to, to probability theory and then we can do some examples. Um, I think again, like kind of what I was saying is that the, the interesting thing about a probability theory is that it just has like a broad range of applications basically because like probability theory goes hand in hand with statistics and statistics is whatever it's needed. Like it's really what's used for anything that involves like large numbers, right? So, um, you know, there's like, you know, well, I should probably start writing that in the, uh, on the iPad. So let me share the iPad first.
Uh, can can everyone see the iPad? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, well, let me see if I can find the app just before. Let's see. I'll just share the Zoom invitation with like the student. Uh, oops. Thank you. I need to log off. Oh, sorry about this. Uh, okay. Copy invite link. I'll send it. Okay, so yeah, let me share it again. Like the other thing, okay, yeah, let me wait a little a second before um, the iPad, iPad becomes available one more time. Yeah, so the funny thing about probability is like, um, you know, there are many different areas in mathematics. Um, geometry is kind of like geometry, algebra, um, calculus, you know, um, linear algebra for those who have taken it, differential equations, like, I mean, different parts of mathematics. Um, like the classic ones, like, uh, geometry and algebra, like, you know, have been for centuries being developed um, since the Greek, I mean, Greeks and before, even before that, like Egyptians, Babylonians, whatever. But something like probability, like in, so by comparison, probability is a lot like of a more recent uh, development in mathematics. In fact, um, of course, like people thought about probably in probably in probabilistic terms, through, like since forever, but it's not like like you know like uh, in the sense like of creating like a theory of probability that you could use for different problems. That's kind of like a more recent development, and so it kind of appeared in connection to like uh, in many ways. Like it actually appeared in connection with games of gambling, <laughs> ironically. So uh, many of the earlier problems in probability was just kind of to solve problems about gambling. Um, so and get game, games of chance. So in a sense, like there's like um, many class, like, you know, that's why one of the reasons why many textbooks in probability is just like about rolling dice or like tossing a coin. It just has like this um, historical connection to gambling, uh, making bets, things like that. So like, um, and then uh, what happened, um, like what's interesting about like a game, like games of chance, like, you know, throwing coins um, or rolling a dice is that it's like a sort of like, if you think about it as like a game or like an experiment, it's an experiment that can be repeated multiple times, right? So kind of that's uh, one of the key concepts, in, like one of the things that makes probability work or like a, a place where probability can become useful is when you are talking about events that can be repeated, right? So let's, maybe I should write that down. Uh, for example, uh, throwing a coin or uh, rolling a die.
So in fact, like um, uh, it's kind of so ingrained into the notion of probability that there are many things that wouldn't make a lot of sense um, uh, without it. So you know, um, maybe you're like you're playing a game with a friend and you want like you're uh, what like you're playing chess or whatever and you want to decide who goes first um and then you would throw like a coin to you know whoever like uh wins like would go first right so it, you know people wouldn't agree to that method if they they th they didn't think that the coin was fair right so there's this concept of a, like a about a coin being fair right uh okay <laughs> and here's like you know it's kind of like a thing that you could try to like ask a person right like what's like the easiest i mean what the thing that would come to mind if you, uh, you ask someone what do they mean by a fair coin like this is like you know we can do it like more open and like try to do this like as a conversation so what would you say like um if someone would answer what a coin being fair means You could say on weighted sides, yes. That's one way to, to put it. Um, and there are other things people would say. Um, well, that's like that's actually a good one. Like, uh, right, a coin with two tails wouldn't be fair. I mean, you would like to, the outcomes to be different, right? Um, so yeah, you want heads and tails, that's good. Um, but yeah, like kind of like, you know, like probably how people would say it is like there's 50 50 like you know 50 percent chance of it landing on heads and 50 percent chance of landing of being tails right so you kind of want to say something like that like there's an equal chance of the coin If that, if that makes sense. And so, um, you know, that kind of gets a little, can be a little bit tricky, but, um, you know, kind of everyone agree. It does seem like reasonable that if you were only allowed to, you know, think about this as an experiment, right? Like if you have like a coin and you want to determine if it's fair or not, if you're only allowed to throw it once, it doesn't seem that you would be successful in figuring that out, right? You kind of have to be allowed to throw it a bunch of times to try to, um, you know, uh, start getting suspicious if something fishy is going on. So for example, if you are allowed to throw the coin a hundred times and 99, 99 of those times uh, you it landed uh, on heads, you kind of would think that there's something odd going on, right? If you know what I mean. So of course it's not a proof of anything, but that's kind of how you develop a little bit of like intuition, like, you know, for what your expectations are. So like, um, you know, if there wouldn't be anything weird. Like if you just throw it two times and you get cat, cat like, you know, the, but if you throw it a hundred times and 99 of those times it landed cats, then you start thinking, okay, maybe there's something odd. Uh, weird going on so like a lot of the things in probability um they just like for them to kind of become interesting or like have like some power to them it does require like um multiple repetitions of the same event if that if that makes sense um so like experimentally you know you would try to determine this by you know uh throwing the coin multiple times and just checking like the frequencies like you know, how many times you get heads, how many times you get tails, right? Um, so from like ex experimental point of view, uh, you could try You could try to throw the coin uh, 
multiple times and check uh, the frequencies of, you know, how many times it landed cats, how many times you got tails. So for example, if he had like, um, if, um, if uh, you had done like a uh, hundred experiments, like that's kind of, this kind of how we would think uh, just to introduce a little bit of the notation. Um, so N usually will be like the, a letter that we'll use many times to just count how many experiments we're doing or, um, how many measurements you're taking, for example. Um, if you're doing like a hundred experiments and like, you know, the number of, um, number of uh, tails was like, you know, let's say 54. And the number of cats, um, was well should uh, it should come, uh, be the opposite like uh it's, it's 46 right then you would like to say something that like kind of like the frequency in this particular experiment right the frequency of tails was 54 over 100 right We, you could write it something like this, F of T, F for frequency, right? Would be 54 over 100, which is 0.54, right? And the frequency of hats, which would, you could write F of H for frequency of hats would be 46 over 100, uh, and that's 0.46, right? So, um, I mean, that kind of maybe seems roughly reasonable to what you would expect the third coin to be behave like, because it would also, you wouldn't expect in general that if you throw like the coin a hundred times, it should land 50 times cat and 50 times tails, you know what I mean? So kind of like the idea of like probability theory is to make like this statements um, more precise. But there's like this view, uh, which is sometimes called like the frequency interpretation of probability that kind of tells you that these numbers that you're getting, right? Um, these frequencies that you're uh, getting, if you did sufficiently many experiments instead of a hundred, maybe a million or 10 million, then this, not, this frequency should actually get closer and closer to 0.5 or one half if the coin had been fair. Like you, it's kind of almost like the definition of what you would like to, uh, um, what you would like to mean by a coin being fair. So like there's this thing called the frequency interpretation. of probability where, um, you know, one would expect these frequencies if you do many, many experiments, right? Any experiments like this, one would expect, or one would like to say, the the frequencies, these two frequencies would get closer to 0.5 for a, a fair coin. to 2.5 for a third coin. Uh, well, yeah, like in a sense, not really. You kind of have to <laughs> eat, eat, like, you know, you can never really determine if 
practice like uh like with absolute certainty that a coin would be fair or not like in the real world you know uh like from a math okay this is like the difference between a mathematician and everyone else a mathematician will just tell you oh let's assume that the coin is fair right that's what a mathematician would do so the mathematician will totally ignore the problem of figuring out that the coin was fair that's a given for for the mathematician for the physicist for the engineer for the social scientist for everyone else in the planet you want to know oh should we assume that the coin is fair or not you know uh it is also important to actually um check whether the hypothesis is, is reasonable or not if you know what i mean but the mathematician will just start with whatever hypothesis they want so they will be like let's just assume that a coin is fair and that's kind of like the the perspective that we will take in the course for um for most purposes so we won't be like kind of going into like the actual uh work of how you would determine these probabilities uh Many, many times like you would just like, assume that the probabilities are given, but, uh, but still, once you assume that the probabilities have certain values, then you can draw conclusions. And that's kind of more like the approach that we would take um, if, you know, if, that, if that makes sense. No, actually, uh, okay, so <laughs> uh, it depends what, like it is kind of this is kind of like an expectation you would like to say you have to be careful in to what extent you can prove this like there is something called the law of large numbers that kind of like points in the direction that this is like a good intuition to have but still it's not like a proof proof that that the frequency would get closer to the expected results uh again this will require a little bit of time to build up to those things but um I'm just saying that that's like, you know, in practice, it does feel that if you ask someone what they mean by a coin being fair, it, I'm just trying to point out that it should involve the possibility of running the experiment multiple times. You know what I mean? Because if you were only allowed to the, to throw the, profit, the coin once, it's not clear how would you determine like the coin from being, being fair from not being fair. You know what I mean? Uh, but yeah, I, of course, like these are good questions. This is actually what makes probability like a uh, tricky subject because it once you start thinking about it even for a coin you you can start asking many questions about what all this means uh, uh and you know like the people who are really more interested in that will go into philosophy or, or like you know or other things um uh, as the mathematician again we'll just assume that it is whatever you want it to be um but yeah so but it is like an, uh, at least from this experimental point of view uh it seems like uh for most uh, applications like you do want to use probability for areas where you can run an experiment multiple times still like that doesn't quite agree with the way in which people use probability maybe on your daily life right because like you might say well what's the probability that my friend will get married right like that's uh, sometimes how people talk and so if you ask that, it's not that you expect that you can run that experiment, you know, a hundred times. You cannot like make a hundred clones of your friend, you know, put them in slightly different conditions and think like, oh, count how many times your friend will get married within five years. You know what I mean? So, um, so there's certain uh, events, you know, where it kind of looks like it's not so clear how you would repeat them, where still you will try to give, talk about probability, right? Uh, you can say like, oh, it's more likely that my friend will get married in five years than not. So there's like a probability statement, right? You're trying to make like a statement that the probability of getting married is higher than the probability of not getting married, which is fine. I'm not saying you cannot do that, but I'm just saying it, it is a little bit more tricky because then you're like losing the connection with um, this frequency interpretation. Is that making sense? Uh, so that's why other people, like, you know, there are other interpretations of probability where it, it kind of measures more like a degree of like of uncertainty or like a belief, like uh, it kind of like a way to quantify your belief about something happening because if, from that perspective, then it seems like more like applicable to cases that can only be done once or a very few times. Is that making sense? Uh, 
Uh, in fact, I mean, I don't know. Uh, has has anyone uh, heard about Pascal's wager? Yeah. Uh, so what is it about? Do you know what? It, do you remember what it said? Or you know what it said? It's <laughs> like a devil or something, right? So. Well, uh huh. Like if the devil knows everything, oh no, Pascal Wager is a different thing. It's uh, about that was, uh -huh, God uh -huh, exists or does not. It's like, right, right, uh, right. So, uh -huh. Yes. So you want like uh, it's better for you to believe in a God than not to believe in the God, because the reward for being in a, believing in the God is better than the loss you gain for not believing in one mm -hmm. because of your because of uh, like you lose more if you don't believe in god then uh yeah something like yeah that. no that's that's actually a good summary more or less so pascal was actually one of the creators of probability you know like in the ninth all this like as i was saying probability is relatively recent but you know it's still up to like the 19th century like almost all scientists were religious to some extent right so pascal was a christian so he wanted to give like arguments for the existence of god so the pascal wager is like a famous argument because it can kind of say well there are like two cases right either god exists or it does or god does not exist so if you like you know the argument of the wager is like if you if you uh you know if you if god does not exist but you just like believe that god exists like you don't lose too much you know um presumably maybe you lost some time participating in the religious rituals that you are interested in uh, for but if god exists and you believe then the reward would be immense if you believe like in some conception that god would reward you after you die so like in, in a, like actually you can rephrase like the pascal wager like uh, in terms of what's called the expected value so it's kind of like saying like if you make the bet you know as a bet like that god would exist like you would get more rewards you know it, because even if it's like a low probability event if you thought that it, it like you know the uh, like the reward that comes the gains that come from it you know would be so immense that it kind of makes it like a rational thing to do. So it's like, an, I mean, I'm, it's just saying like, it is a fun thing to think about because uh, it is like an application of probability, whether you think of that is fair or not to like a situation where it's not so clear how to what extent it consists like in an, ex uh, of an experiment, right? Because it's not that you would experiment on God existing or not. So like, you know, there are different uses of probability. Um, uh, but yeah, there is a lot of uh, literature on this, like um, probably the stuff like for like more like religious oriented uh, people and things like that, which is kind of fun. Uh, it has like, different versions like this Pascal Wager stuff, um, which are more like, you know, they're better. There are some that are more interesting than, than others for someone who is like, you know, more secular, like, you know, there's like this fine tuning argument, which uh, which you may have heard or not, that says like, if, you know, like the universe has like some fundamental constants, like the charge of the electron, the mass of the electron, the mass of the proton, the charge of the proton, et cetera, et cetera. And so the fine tuning argument is that if you actually change a, one of those constants by a tiny, 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 tiny bit, then there's almost like no possibility of having galaxies or life being formed and things like that. So in a sense, like the values that the constants take is very, very, uh, very low probability. So if it's very, very, very low probability, the only way for that to happen is like if there was some intelligence that it made, made it all happen. I mean, I'm not like trying to assess like the credibility of these arguments, but I'm just trying to say that it is like probability does like allow you to go, you know, down the rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> well, right, like that's actually a counter argument to the Pascal wager. Uh, but like the fine tuning argument is a, more, is a lot more sophisticated because it's like a, an astronomical argument. It's just like saying that the probability, you know, the, the values of the fundamental concepts of the universe are really specific. And if they had different values, then almost any other value would not create life and things like that. But yeah, no, I agree. I mean, there are many comebacks like for the Pascal wager, but it's still like a fun thing exercise to think about, like, you know. Um, 
but yeah, yeah. I'm just saying it like for food for thought, like as people say. Um, but okay, so the the whole point about this is like for probably for what you're studying, like you will have the opportunity to do many experiments, like you know, engineering, uh, social sciences, like you know, like one of the reasons why probably it is so useful now is because of like you now, you know, you can collect large amounts of data about people through the internet or things like that. Like that's kind of how chat GPT and all these like, you know, things that are so fun now these days work. They just like have huge humongous amounts of data and then they can use like statistical methods to, to pre make predictions of what, how you should answer like a question and things like that, which kind of like reasonably agrees with what you would expect if you had asked like a human. So, I mean, I'm, I, I'm just saying like for us, like thankfully probability will be used in most situations where it is actually, you do have like the possibility of running the experiment multiple times, but you still may want to leave open the possibility for it being used for situations where it can, maybe that doesn't happen. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so the classic, uh, maybe just to keep going, uh, with this, like the classic, what's, what's actually called like the classic interpretation of probability. Um, and this is kind of like the one that was developed at the beginning of probability, like in the Renaissance, like scientific revolution. Is that um, you know the probability like I'll give you some examples. Uh, let me write it like this: um, P of an event so this is going to be called the oops. So the probability of an event is, um, th yeah, this is how we'll, re we'll read this. So this is called the probability of an event. It's going to be um, the number of outcomes fit, um, where the event um, is going to be a ratio basically between the number of outcomes favorable to E, or let me put it like where E happens, maybe. Oops. Divided by the number, the total, uh, number of all possible outcomes. And I'm, okay, and obviously I'm about to give you some examples because I'm, this the way in which I'm writing it, it can be a little bit uh, confusing. So, Let me just write a number of outcomes where E happens. So that it sounds a little bit better. Okay. Uh,
So let me give you an example. So And again, like a, a lot of like the spirit of this course is just like the, the definitions, like the formulas themselves are kind of straightforward. It's just like doing like a couple like key examples where like you can start kind of see them in practice so that you get like an idea of how they're supposed to be used. So let me do some an example here, like very straightforward, where like you're rolling a die. So the experiment could be rolling be rolling a die. So remember a dice has six faces, right? A cube. And let, I mean, just like, and as in the usual way, let's call the faces one, two, three, four, five, six, right? So you could ask, um, you could ask for the probability, like what, in, in this definition, like the probability of like getting an, an the, the uh, dice lands on an even number. So what should that be? Like, we are supposed to count, like, again, you have to think it, it's like an experiment. So like the experiment, like the, what could have happened is that the, what you see uh, the dice lands on is one, two, three, four, five, six, right? One of those six possible outcomes. And so in this definition, like, or from this perspective, what you have to see count is like in how many, um, how many times it could have um, land, like, you know, what are between, from one to six, what are the even numbers? There are, uh, yeah, there are two, four and six, right? So there are like three po uh, positive outcomes, right? To this hypothesis, right? Like, or three favorable outcomes. Right, which are three, uh, sorry, which are two, four, six. And what's the total possible number of outcomes? That's just like the uh, number of different faces you could get, like, or different numbers you could la land on. That's just uh, six, right? Six, uh, six sides for the, uh, for the die or die. Uh, so, So the probability is three six, um, which is one half or a point five, right? Which you know, when usually for us probability will always um, be written in decimal with decimal notation. Like of course, if you wanted, you could write it as uh, percentages. So that would be like a fifty percent chance of it landing even. Is that making sense? Yeah. Any questions about this one? How far so good? Um, okay, here's one, and I want you to think about it. So I'll give you some time to think about it because it's actually uh, kind of fun. Uh, in fact, it was asked to Leibniz. Like Leibniz was one of the people, two people who created calculus together with Newton. So we'll see if you answer the way he did. <laughs> uh, so he got it wrong, by the way. <laughs> so, like, we'll see. I mean, so you are in good company if you make his mistake. So, so I don't want to give you all the details because like, if I give you all the details, I'll spoil it. But so for example, now, um, 
it's kind of unfair, but usually this example is called Leibniz mistake because okay, he's already dead, so you shouldn't blame him. And he created calculus, so you shouldn't blame him too too bad. Like you know, you're allowed to make um, probability mistakes if you if you create calculus. Uh, even if you don't, but uh, especially if you do. So, so imagine now I have two dice, okay? So here is two dice, which I roll, which I throw simultaneously. So you roll the two dice, like you put them in your hand, right? Shake them and then roll them, throw them. I mean, the, the, they're thrown simultaneously just for dramatic effects, like just to make it like a more like a visceral example. Uh, so, for example, like, you know, you could get once you roll two dice, you could get, for example, uh, you could add the numbers that you get from each of them, right? So you could get, for example, you could get the number 10, right? Because 10 is five plus five. So I just mean that uh, if you got a five on the first die, die and, the sec and a five on the second one, in total, you would get 10, right? Um, so, the, is that making sense? Or if you, like, you know, you could also get, uh, you could also get two, right? You could also get the number two because you would get, that just means that you got one and one on each die. Like you cannot get, uh, like, you know, at least you, you need to get two because like the, the, the numbers on each dice is starts at one, right? So two is the minimum that you could get, right? What's the maximum that you could get as a sum of outcomes? Yeah, 12 is the max you could get, right? Because it would be six plus six, so this is the maximum number sum total sum that you could get. So, so okay, so it's a setup making sense. So you roll the two, two dice. You're just going to add the numbers that you get, right? So what Leibniz was asked is, what is more likely? So what is going to happen more often, right? Uh, so here's the question for him, and now for you. What is what has a higher chance of occurring? When I say higher chance of occurring, it means what is more probable, right? So what is more likely? Um, getting a 10, right? Obtaining the number 10. Or getting the number 11. Okay, so again, I want you to think about this, so don't answer about it right away. I usually also like to do like a mini break because I feel two hours is too long. So let's just take like a five or six min min minutes break if you need to go to the bathroom, whatever, want to take a drink, water, and also think about this problem. And then we'll discuss it when we get back to see what, what you come up with. But it's a fun problem to think about. Well, uh, think about, I mean, try to do it. Like, I don't want to answer that, but try to do it. Like whether you, because it would depend, you know, try to think about whether that would make a difference or not. So, uh, but yeah, there, that's actually one of the things we, you would need to um, consider. But yeah, let's just discuss it like in, I'm just trying to do it like very intuitive, like what you would think happens, but, uh, like just like like you know just think about how you computed um, making like answering those questions on your own and then we'll see what should the answer be. But yeah, let's discuss it like in five minutes. If, if that sounds good. Um, okay, so what you did you think about it? For um, what would you bet on? Are they do they have the same chance or? Is there one one outcome more likely than the other? 
So you're saying ten has more chance. Uh, anyone, uh, you would bet on eleven. So you're saying when you say you would bet on eleven, it's because you're saying eleven has a bigger chance, or because they're just like equally likely. And actually, it makes uh, you could mean it. Um, okay, you're saying more likely. Any other contenders? Okay, so this is like an again like an interesting example just because um, literally someone wrote like a letter to Leibniz in that time, but you know, uh, only letters were like the main source of communication. And as I said, like uh, originally probability started a lot because like of gambling. So like what this person wrote to Leibniz was, oh, when I was playing this game, I thought that ten and eleven should appear that's roughly the same amount of time. But he was noticing that ten was appearing more often than eleven. So, like this, is, uh, this gets back to that stuff I was saying before that uh, you know you were kind of running the experiment multiple times of running of throwing the dice, and like you were just noticing like a pattern that ten was being it was occurring more 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 times. Okay. So in fact, like oh, for this problem, it's kind of like again, if you have the right picture in mind, the problem can simplify a lot. So what you can do to make this psychologically easier is kind of give assign a color to each dice. So like, let's think of the first one as being um, red. So the one dice is going to be color red, and the other one is going to be color blue. So I'm making like some sort of matrix for those who have seen this before, okay? So, you know, or this array usually is called like a matrix. And I'm just going to put, um, okay, first of all, how many um, entries uh, are we going to put here? Well, we're going to have six uh well six columns right and six rows so six by six is 36 so there should be 36 entries you know uh, in this array yeah no that's a, and well uh, this is why it's called Leibniz mistake because Leibniz actually uh also forgot about that about it so and then like i'm going to put um i'm going to put on each array like you know um i'm going to put on each of these boxes that the, just the sum. So one plus one gives me two, one plus two gives me three, then four, five, six, seven. And then is there something some something similar here is uh three one plus two is three, four, five, six, seven. Right, and then like two plus two is four, five, six. Seven, eight, and then uh, well, uh, well, that's actually what I'm about to discuss. Um, just let me finish the table. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, but like that's like the, the 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 heart of the question, right? Uh, Then uh, six, uh, seven, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine, and then eight, nine, ten, and then nine, ten, and then ten, eleven, eleven, twelve. Okay, so um. Is this uh is this table making sense? Okay, yeah. Um everyone okay, first everyone agrees with the table itself of, of the sum, right? Like let's just check uh that the table itself is fine, <laughs> right? 
So I think I got, I think I added everything correctly. And then uh, what you would see here, right, is that 10 appears three times, right? Let me put um and eleven appears two times, right? So okay, now just okay. So again, it's not so clear, like maybe like the first time you see this, but kind of like this is actually going back to this question about um, before that we went into the break, uh, whether or not it mattered that the die were distinguishable. It just happens to be the case that it, it, like, you know, for the out, like, you know, there are like getting four from dice one and six from dice two is different from getting six from dice one and four from dice two. They're because they're different objects and they, kind of like, you know, the, you know, their outcomes can be distinguished. So like the fact that I'm coloring the dice is just to kind of like emphasize the fact that they are distinct objects, you know, um, and that's kind of why, um, you know, it, this, the, the, you know, the, the stand is kind of, comes with a different outcome than this stand. And this 11 counts as a different outcome that that's 11. Yeah, so usually for the, like the convention will be that, uh, you will be, I would say explicitly on a given problem, whether they are being considered distinguishable, I mean, identical or not in that sense, like whether, um, yeah, you know, like there will, like you'll see like in the phrases that there are, there are ways to, that, that will be made clear whether we care about that or not. But what I'm trying to say is that here, like literally what happened was like that this person was doing the experiment because he was a gambler and he just happened to notice, you know, that 10 appeared more frequently. In fact, like you could compute the probabilities, right? What's, what would be the probability of a 10 here of getting 10? Well, it would be uh, three because there are three variable outcomes di di divided by by thirty six, and that's one twelve. Uh, well, right. Even if they were, like, yeah. In fact, yeah. Even if you build them of the same color, like they do, yeah, yeah, yeah. It still matters. But I'm just saying, like, if you color them, it kind of like, psychologically makes it easier to swallow. You know, to accept this. Uh, but yeah, like the fact that they um, were colored, like it's not playing a big role. It's just for psychological purposes, if you know what I mean. It's more, com it's more, you know, it's again, it's not like an obvious thing. Uh, and in fact, it's not something, I mean, it's not so clear, like you could just like decide of it on it. Like you may think that you could decide on it without doing any sort of experiment, right? That it had to be this case, but it is actually comforting to know that it does work this way. Is that making sense? Um, and so probability of getting a, a 10 would be three over 36 and probability of getting an 11 would be two over 36, right? Which is one over 30. Uh, so what about this question? It only doesn't matter if it's one, one or two, two. So I don't know if I answered that already or like if you want to cut, I'm not sure if I followed that part. Uh, I don't know if I already answered that part, that question. Oh, that you can change.
yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like that is okay. Right, right, right. Like the uh, good, good. Um, uh, yeah, kind of in a sense. Um, <laughs> what we the one um, getting dice one getting two and dice two getting two is the same as dice two getting two and dice one getting two. The important thing is kind of like that one was called dice one and the other was called dice two, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't matter how you report the data. You know, if you're over the phone, you know, you're telling your friend, oh, uh, um, but yeah, so, I mean, we are not, right, like, uh, is that kind of, we're already, like, kind of like the order it is being, accounted for like in the fact that the dice are being distinguished so in that sense like i mean what i'm trying to say um it's a little bit it can it's that like if you talk about it in words like okay let me put it in this way how will i report this uh like how i may report like how would i report like yeah, you know it's an experiment i would i would write like getting tense i would write it as like Four six, uh, five five, and um, six four, right? That's how I would write the events of getting a ten. Uh, in that, because under this convention, right, like the first entry always refers to the red die, to the red one, for example, or like the blue. It doesn't matter. But like this is dice one. Dice one, dice one, and dice two, dice two, dice two. Of course, like, you know, you could change your mind about how you, like, are entering the data, but I'm just saying, like, uh, in this sense, the, the order does matter in the sense that we have, like, a convention for, re you know, that, <laughs> like, yes, it's going to get a little bit confusing. But what I'm trying to say is that we do want to, we do want to keep track of which dice landed on what, Right, so one way to do that is with an order pair, which is what this is called, right? There would be other ways to do this, but like the important thing is kind of to report the data in a way that you know which one, um, you know, which dice landed on what. Is, is that making sense? I'm just saying that that's, that can be represented in different ways. You know, how, how, uh, how to report that a dice landed on a given number that can be reported in different ways, but we do care about knowing that uh, for this problem. Okay. Is that so far so good? Any questions about this? Now there are like this is like actually funny, uh, like as an aside, but it's a like, cool thing to know. So there is a thing uh, called um, so this is called like usually classic. I mean this is like uh, classical probability or classical st statistics. Um, there's like a thing called Bosonic Bose Einstein statistics. And that's actually something that's not used for things called bosons. Like um, that's a more advanced, advanced. But bosons are certain types of uh, particles, like uh, well, photons or like 
I think helium, I mean, there are certain elements of some, ato some atomic particles and chemistry and things like that. Some of which are bosons, others are called fermions. And so they, uh, <laughs> the bosons ones, like they do, <laughs> if you could build the dice, like a macroscopic dice, like one you could actually play, it up, play with that behave like a boson, then for these ones, like it wouldn't make a difference. Uh, they like in the sense like they actually wouldn't distinguish between uh, you know four six and six four. So it, for it, it would be kind of like playing with dice where it only matter like it doesn't matter on which which is the dice that landed on on a given number. Only the the, the numbers at the end. So in this case, for this case, it wouldn't matter. In this case. Uh, it wouldn't matter uh, which is the dice that lands on the given number. Uh, it only matter the only matters like the two like. Number, uh, like the outcomes themselves. So just to see if this makes sense. So for example, what that means is that um, just to copy um, this table. I'll, I'll copy it in a different way. I'll enter the entries in a different way, just to make it more clear. Let me write it as pairs. So one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, two, one, two, 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 three, two, four, Two five, two six, three one, three two, three three, three four, three five, three six, four one, four two, four three, four four, four five, four six, so then five one. Five two, five three, five four, five five, five six, and six one, six two, six three, six four, six five, six six. So what I'm trying to say, okay, we have seen before that um, this I, this line was the one that would lead to a 10, right? And this other line would, would lead to the 11, right? So what I'm saying is that uh, in this game, if you could play with these dice made out of bosons, these bosonic dice, uh, in the case of bosonic dice, it doesn't, um, the fact that this one, the first one landed is um, on a four and the next, a second landed on a six, it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's kind of the same as the, um, as first, the first one landing on a six and the um, second one landing on a four. So kind of they don't distinguish uh, on which one landed or what. They just care about the actual numbers. So you would only care that there's like a four and a six and not like a six and a four. So it just, it just, you wouldn't care about 
who landed on what. So in this case, like the probability, like the number of outcomes that would give you a 10 would just be four, six and five, five. Okay, so here like, like number of outcomes that gives a 10 would be four plus six and five plus five. So we don't count like in this case, like um, the order doesn't like, you know, which one landed on what doesn't matter if that makes sense. Is that making sense? And then, uh, so instead of being three outcomes that give you a, a 10, what I'm trying to say is that now there would only be two because for these dies, it would only matter where, it, you know, the numbers that you got. Um, and then the number of outcomes that gives you, uh, how many outcomes would then give you an 11? Yeah, now it's only five, six, right? Like five plus six, so we, It's just one outcome because it's now 11 is five plus six. And again, for this weird bosonic dice, it doesn't matter who got the five and who got the six. Like they don't care. And that's literally how some subatomic particles behave. Like they don't, it only matters like, uh, <laughs> like the numbers, not which one carries the number in a sense. Now, how many, like before, uh, here's like a more interesting question. Uh, how, before we had 36 possible outcomes, right? Because those were the entries, like, you know, six by six is 36, right? Do we still have 36 possible outcomes? How many outcomes do you think we have now? Is it still 36 or is it less? Oh, good. I see this agreement. This is good. <laughs> so let's see. I think what I will do is add this, 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 and this, right? Everyone sees that? Because all the other stuff is being repeated. Is that making sense? Because like two one is already being counted in one two because like now we only care about the actual numbers and not like who got what. So it would be six plus five plus four plus three plus two plus one. And how much does that give us? That's 16, 15, 18, 20, 21. Good, so it was 21. Just making sense with uh, with everyone, because um, is that clear?
Yeah, no, like, uh, yes, that, 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 that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, we, we still need to count the diagonal. That's okay. They are allowed. So in this case, the probability of getting an, uh, an 11, I'm uh, sorry, a 10, would be two outcomes, right? Divided by 21. And the probability of getting uh, at an 11 would be one over 21. Is that, isn't that fun? It's kind of interesting to, to see that in practice. We, and there are different numbers, right? There are different numbers uh, than this, this other two, right? So if you were like, you know, if you were like an experimentalist, that's actually what you would think. You would think, uh, I mean, maybe you don't know if you're the regular dice that you have in your pocket when you, that you buy at the store should behave like this first, like this first calculation or the second calculation. And so what you could actually do is to try to run the experiment multiple times and see which outcomes, what sort of fractions or percentages are you get, getting. And it just happens to be the case that you know it is that you're get, you get fractions <laughs> which are relatively closer to these numbers than fractions that are closer to these numbers. And that's why you would say that guys behave in this way, you know? But there are other things in nature like bosons that do behave in this way, you know? And the only way to know that is because you do the experiment and the frequencies just behave under um, in this, in this way or it's more like if you postulate that then you get like the correct predictions uh, in statistical mechanics or something else but i'm just saying it's not like an obvious thing um in practice like you know how you determine this but for the mathematician this is not a problem you just say whether you want to regard whether you just have to say from the very beginning of the problem do you want to do the count assuming that who gets what matters or do you want to do the count not caring about who gets what you just need Say that at the beginning of your mathematical problem, and then you don't care about how do you determine in nature what what is what is the actual truth. Is that making? Is that okay? And just to finish for today, like the only the last one is kind of fun. Is the the, the other thing next to uh, besides po bosons are called fermions. Uh, so there's this thing called the Fermi Dirac statistics. So this is related if you have taken to the, uh, I don't know if you have seen this in chemistry, the ex Pauli exclusion principle. Have you seen that before? If not, you can do it. Have you heard that or, or you haven't? I think the Pauli exclusion principle says something that like the two electrons, I think can occupy the same space, same time, something like that. Uh, yeah, it's basically says like, for example, in, in the case of electrons, uh, the two electrons cannot have like the, quant the same quantum numbers basically, uh, whatever quantum numbers are. I mean, they're not weird numbers. It's just like the way <laughs> certain properties of the electrons are given certain numbers and those numbers are called quantum numbers, but they're like regular integers or half integers. Um, so I'm not sure what FR, oh well, yeah, what is for FR in this question on the chat? <laughs> But yeah, it's kind of like, so based, like another way to say it is that electrons don't like to be next to one another. That's like what happens with fermions. And so like the, the, the fermions um, are kind of like the bosons, but you are not, if you could build fermionic dice, it would be kind of like dice that cannot, they don't want to land never on the same number. So you, on, with fermionic dice, let me write it, write it down. They are like bosons. but the same outcome cannot be repeated.
have uh, repetitions. So for example, 10, right, 10, which was five plus five involves a repetition of the number five, right? Five is repeated twice. They are not allowed with the fermions. Fermions do not like this. The dice will do whatever it takes to land on different values. So this would not be allowed to happen now. Is that making sense? So the fermions, they just, hate being together. They just hate taking the same values. So it's still like bosons where like, it only matters who gets what, who landed on what, but in addition to that, they cannot tolerate having the same values. So now the probability of getting a 10 is, uh, okay, so let's check now, the, let's do the table again for fermions. So what should, like what happens? So yeah, there are two conditions on this. The, the previous condition for this boson stuff that I mentioned, and now in addition to that, this thing about hating being the same value. So what's happening now is that I literally can delete these diagonal elements, right? Because the diagonal is the only place where like the values are repeated, if you, if you see. So now the probability, right, like the outcomes for a 10, for getting a 10, what is just uh, 10 equals four plus six, and that's all that there is, right? There's no longer five plus five. It got rid of, we got rid of it. So it's only one outcome. And the outcomes for getting an 11, right, is just five plus six, right? So there's only one. So in this case, uh, in this weird fermion game, fermionic guys, uh, 10 can only happen in one way and 11 can only happen in one way. Is that making sense? And what's the total number of outcomes in this case? It's now 15, good. It's literally these one, five plus four plus three plus two plus one, right? Five plus four plus three plus two plus one, which is 15. So the probability of getting a 10 is one over 15 and the probability of getting an 11 is one over uh, 15. So, and, and they are now the same, right? Does that make sense?
And so again, like if you were unsure of whether some object behaves, if you act, if someone claimed to have built fermionic dyes, the expectation would be that if you throw them a couple of times, you would get these probabilities for 10 and 11, or these frequencies for getting 10 and 11. Okay. Um, but again, like in math, as a mathematical problem, we just say from the beginning, we are just going to assume that this is being counted uh, this way or not. No, so actually what happens is that it's kind of funny. Uh, we will talk about it once we do the something called the Stirling approximation. The problem is that kind of, like the thing is like fermions are, for example, electrons and things like that. Uh, the thing is like a macroscopic object, right? Like kind of like the ones that you see here are kind of like uh, has has millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of you know of particles making them up. Once the numbers are sufficiently large. <laughs> Uh, all these probabilities start more or less being the same, taking the same values. <laughs> so for large numbers, they're kind of like the, the ratios that you would get are almost indistinguishable. So you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. That's kind of how you recover the classical uh, classical statistics from the quantum statistics. And uh, uh, it's a fun exercise to do. Oh, once we learn a couple of things, I'll give it to you. But I'm I'm just trying to say that here we do see like an actual not difference in the values for the probabilities. But once you have 10, 2 billion particles, like one probability would be like 0.5 and the other one would be like 0.499999. You see like it almost becomes indistinguishable. So you cannot tell it apart experimentally. So macroscopically, you would never be able to build it, if, if that makes sense. You kind of have to do experiments with few electrons or few. Yeah, well, it's, you have to be more careful because like also the numerator can become larger. So it's like a competition. It's a calculus problem. You have to take some limits. But yeah, it, what I'm trying to say is like, it's kind of like one of these fun things. Like sometimes like, <laughs> like that's also one of the weird things with probability that um, many things just behave differently uh, once you have a lot of them or very few of them. So like, the behavior of certain things does depend a lot on how many particles you have. So one of the reasons why um, the macroscopic world is so different from the microscopic world is just that you're dealing with so many molecules that make up a, gi a given like piece of material that you touch in your daily life. So it just like it almost is for practical purposes as if you were dealing with an infinite number of particles. So many limits. Uh, in probability, in classical statistical mechanics, uh, which is a branch of physics that does this, they just take a limit when the number of particles goes to infinity and things like that. Uh, and then, like almost all these differences just like disappear. So, but yeah, so that's kind of like why in practice you cannot really would not be able to build such a device. So many of these things for them to, um, um, you know, to have something similar to this, you actually have to be working with very few particles for, for the effects to be noticeable. But yeah, it's a fun, cal fun calculation. We'll do it uh, uh, later. Like you'll see, I mean, if this is like a fun, like this is where like probability is very, can be very playful. Like you can try, just try to do the same with three classical dice, three bosonic dice and three fermionic dice. Just choose like some outcomes to see how the probabilities change. And if you want to really be adventurous, like try to give like a formula that would give you, like, I mean, there are ways to find the formula for, like if you had, uh, if you throw N dice, each one has like M faces, like you maybe you don't want them to be six faces. Like you want them to have four or 10 or 11 faces, different number of faces. You can compute all these probabilities. So it's like a fun thing to do, but I thought like, you know, many of these things in probability is better to just start with small numbers to convince yourself of the answer. And then you try to extrapolate and figure out what the general formula is. Okay. But I just thought, okay, I thought this could be a fun warm up just to give you like a sense of uh, how this, um, how to think in probability terms. But again, it is, it does take a little, it takes a while because it is very different thought process and, most of the other mathematics you have encountered. So you, we just have to take it slow, but you'll see it can be very fun, especially at the beginning of these combinatorics problems. And you'll see it can be very powerful 
once we talk about independence of events and, and Vegas, Vegas rule. Uh, well, what I'm saying is that if you have 10 to the 23 dice, bosonic dice, the probabilities that you would get there are more or less indistinguishable from the probabilities you would get uh, with 10 to the 23 regular dice. So again, like if one gave you 0.5, right, for a probability, the other one would give you 0.9, uh, 4.9999999999. Uh, so it's not that you would get exactly the same values, is that for all practical purposes, you will not be able to distinguish the values. Is that making sense? Uh, again, like we can, oh, no, it's very interesting. Uh, and this is actually how like, um, you know, for some people who like thermodynamics, that's how, um, that's how like the point of explaining thermodynamics, for thermodynamics, mind, thermodynamics is about pressure, volume, temperature. The whole goal of statistical mechanics is to explain thermodynamics from, you know, probability calculation. So for example, what is temperature? Temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles that make up a molecule. Um, what's entropy? I mean, we'll talk about entropy. It's actually, you can define it uh, for, um, for other purposes in, in this class, so, which is kind of fun. But like many of the uh, properties that you know from chemistry, um, the ideal gas law and things like that, you like the goal of statistical physics is just to get derive them or deduce them from the properties of uh, the atoms that make it up, the, the gas, for example, but it really depends on the fact that you have a gazillion number of atoms. It wouldn't work if you only had 10 atoms. So if like, a gas consisted of 10 atoms, it would behave tremendously different from if you have 10 to the 23. And you will see it from the math. You would see it in the, from the mathematics just because there are kind of like limits involved, like certain quantities going to infinity and things like that. But uh, yeah, the uh, it, I can, like we'll like, again like there's so many fun problems that you can do. So we'll do uh, again some other interesting examples uh, next class uh, involving birthdays, which has nothing to do with all this stuff. But you'll see that the answer that you get is completely dependent uh, on how many days on a year you, you, you assume that a year has. So uh, you'll see what I mean by that um, when we talk about it on Wednesday. But the, one of the takeaways of probability theory is that things can behave very differently when you have millions of them versus when you have a couple few of them. And that's why like, um, you know, you can predict to some extent, like how markets work or, um, you know, people behave because like the individual choices of a person could be completely difficult to predict, but on the aggregate, on the average, they just follow regularities. So, but yeah, I guess it does take a, some time to get used to it. So, but I think it's a good place to end for today's class. So I'll send you the recording. I'll send you the uh, notes for today. So, and I'll see you on Wednesday. For now, I, I'll make, just give you a couple of things to think about, but um, more like for, again, just to start working your brain on these sorts of problems. But uh, since today was the first class, I won't, um, there's not too much yet to worry about. Okay. Okay, good, good, bye. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one. You too, you too. So there's nothing due for Wednesday, right? There is nothing due for Wednesday, correct. I'll just give you maybe some problems to think about, but we'll discuss them in class. All right, cool. See you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. bye. Hi. Thank you, oh, I Thank you Professor. To make sure, um, I didn't miss anything important in the beginning since I wasn't able to join at first. Oh, yeah, I recorded the class, so you can watch the first few minutes if you want. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry about yeah, yeah. that. No, I think it's just that you do have to log in through Canvas. I, know, I wasn't sure if you tried. I don't know how you were trying to log in, but... Hopefully it wouldn't happen next time, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, like it's weird. Um, like no one else, no one else had that problem, so I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure either. I had tried to log in through Canvas using the link that you had posted in the announcement. I tried it multiple times, okay. but it wasn't well, working uh, on my computer. But uh -huh. I just logged in on my phone, so if oh, it's okay. an issue, I can just do it on my phone. Well, in any case, like next time I'll have office hours right before class, so you can just mm -hmm. try to log in a couple of minutes before that. To, it will be the same Zoom link, and 
if that's not working, then we can just see what's going on. But yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, good. Bye. 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 Uh, professor, mm -hmm. uh, I actually emailed you earlier about um about like the credit stuff because like I had to wait for my uh, credit to transfer from Middlesex. Oh right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, do you know if I'll be able to like? I mean, the SPN is up to the math department, right? Correct. Yes. Okay, and then I mean, okay. So, assuming like I can get an SPN, huh? I mean, in the meantime, just assume that you're enrolled if you want to so start taking everything as normal. And if for some reason they don't give you the SPN, well, you can continue, of course, showing up, but maybe you wouldn't be interested. So like, but I mean, in the meantime, yeah, you can just do everything as, as if you were enrolled in the class. If that's, that's what would be my recommendation. I wouldn't expect it to take that many days anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's just like, my because the class uh, at the middle sex supposedly ends on a point. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Yeah, but like I already took the final and I already got the grade from the professor. It's just like, you know, uh -huh. their administration, they're like, oh, we have to wait until the right. for everyone to like finish up and then officiate it. So, oh, okay, I see. Okay. All no, right. no, but that's, you can do that in the meantime. Okay, okay, all right, all right. I'll work on this. Okay. One. All right, thank you. Yeah, sure, sure, no problem. All right.